Well, welcome to Free Thought Forum. I'm Faithless Forrest, and with me is... I'm Joe Barnhart. And this is a program for free thinkers and free thought friendly people. Um, we're here most uh, Tuesdays from 5 to 6 p.m. And uh, we, we have a good program today. We, we, hope. we hope so. This program is sponsored by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'll tell you a little bit about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. Um, we have fun meetups for food and conversation. There's one going on tonight down at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria in the Old City. People will start arriving at about 5.30. Look for the silver jacketed copy of The God Delusion, which we try to have sitting on the table so that you can find us. All right, you want to speak about RET? Well, the Rationalist of East Tennessee usually has meetings at uh, Pellissippi, uh, right next, right, well, at the cafeteria. It's the cafeteria next, annex. Annex, uh huh. And have very good parking space there. <laughs> and it's on good. Sunday mornings, and they usually meet about 10.30. To start, and the program starts about 11, right? Um, no, we, we oh. meet and eat at 10, and then it gets more formal and starts at 10.30. Okay, good. And we're there on the first and third Sunday mornings of most months. Mm -hmm. On the second Sunday of most months, we have the Skeptics Book Club. We're now meeting at Books a Million, which is on Kingston Pike near the Walker Springs uh, intersection. Um, and on... Fourth Sundays of the month, we sometimes have this Reflections Gathering, uh, which is a potluck get-together in the afternoon, usually in a member's home. Uh -huh. At, in the middle of this program, we can talk about the uh, Book of the Month. We'll save that for a mid-program break. Oh, very good. All right. Well, we want to get to our topic then. All right. So uh, last uh, week, uh, Joe asked uh, if uh, I, somewhere I got asked if I would co-host, and we're going to have a program where we're going to talk about sacrifice. Uh -huh. A religious and secular perspective, all okay. right? So I'm going to play the straight man and ask you lots of questions <laughs> on this, Joe. Um, I've read the Bible, and I know there's lots of sacrifice uh, things uh, going on uh, in there. But how do you want to start with this? Well, first of all, let's get just an ordinary meaning of the word sacrifice. I mean, it's most people know what we're talking about, even the sacrifice bunt in baseball. All right. So you give up one thing for the sake of something else is basically right. what this is about. So I... Um, uh, could uh, you know, give up going to um, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I kinda, give up going to the movies in order to do something else to, to have money for it. Yeah, I was going to try and think of something I give up in order to go to the ASK meeting, but the answer is, well, I'm not doing that. I'm, yeah. well, I'm, uh, I'm not indulging well, in a sacrifice. Example there. Is if you if you want to be safe on the freeway, you may give up a little time. There we on go. The freeway in order to save your life. Because you yeah. know that that's important. That, uh, that's a great example. And a friend of mine did not give up smoking, and he died early. And that was a sacrifice of his life. Another friend of mine gave up smoking and saved <laughs> and, and lived longer. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that, that sacrificed the tobacco and gained more life. And the other person uh, sacrificed his life. <laughs> to experience more tobacco. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's funny you use the term both ways, because I would say the person who was not prepared to sacrifice tobacco um, didn't make a sacrifice. Well, uh, usually, they were kind of a, a prisoner to it. Well, yeah. usually in the, in, the, in the religious context, sacrifice is meant you, you, you give a blood sacrifice, although not always, mm -hmm. something of life. Although in some parts of the Hebrew Bible, it's a sacrifice of grain and uh, All right. So I guess when I think about the Bible, which I have read, mm -hmm. the first occurrence of something that seems like sacrifice might be when um, Cain and Abel offer something to the deity, and Cain offers, you know, Cain was apparently a, a farmer, and he offers a sacrifice of grain, mm -hmm. and Abel was a herdsman, and he offers some sort of sacrifice of an, an animal. Mm -hmm. And... And the deity didn't treat both of these sacrifices equally, now, did he? Well, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, now most scholars think that re represents a, uh, the herders versus the farmers' uh -huh. values, and the herders had their view. <laughs> in other words, there isn't captured in this story a social tension that would have been in Israel in... Exactly. So do you suppose that would have been before Solomon's time? Oh, way before Solomon's time. Yeah. Okay, because by Solomon's time, they had a big city, big temple. They were kind of, they were urbanized. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. David's about a, 
uh, 1000 B.C., so it's and Solomon's just after that, of course. Well, if the Bible be true, Solomon is David's son. Yes, uh, one of his sons. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, one of his sons. <laughs> one, one, of one of his wives and uh, all uh, of that. So the sacrifice we're talking about is um, something most people know what, what we're talking about. It's uh, and, and from a, and both in a religious and a secular viewpoint, it means give up one thing for the sake of something else. Huh? Now, in the war, of course, uh, you, you have uh, sacrifices made and people getting killed. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I couldn't help but think then of the second instance that I can think of in the Bible of sacrifice would be after the flood, mm -hmm. Noah sacrifices, I think it's a ram or a sheep or something like mm -hmm. that, which is burnt and makes a sweet savor to the Lord, mm -hmm. if I remember the verses that's, that's correctly. A, that's a, uh, that in those days, the, the, uh, the notion was it's, it's better to, uh, to offer animals, <laughs> uh, although they did have child sacrifices. We'll get into this notion, but we've got a call in already, so let's All see right. what we have. Go ahead to our caller. Let's Can you give us a name or a nickname, please? Hello, Al. Long time no speak. Uh, speak up good and loud now so we can hear you. Can you hear me now? So you, okay, yes, good. Yeah. Usually. Is that too loud? No, you're fine. Just perfect. Keep going. Are you kidding me? Uh, I'm almost yelling over here. It's okay. Sure, Al. We're talking about sacrifice. You're on the I air. See, I see what's at the bottom of the screen. What is the value of sacrifice? Uh huh. So I'm going to ask both you intelligent gentlemen a question. Sure. How do you determine the value of anything? Okay. Of anything. Sure. Well, I would say something is valuable if it improves my life or the lives of others. Wrong. Okay. <laughs> Al, let, well, let's, way, let's, let's hear Joe. Let's hear Joe, question. Al. Let's hear Joe. Joe, you want to make a go for it? Well, we value many things. And some things we can't have if we're going to have other things. So we, we sacrifice some things in order to get the other uh, things. But, but Al's question was, what is value? Did, Al, did I get your question correct? How do you determine the value of anything? There we go. Oh, okay, that's another uh -huh. program. And we'll get into that in another program. Well, it's not another program. It's a question you get at the bottom. What's the value of sacrifice? Okay. So what are you to determine value of anything? Okay, I'll, okay, I'll get on the, I'll get off the subject and get on that. You value something according to what you desire. If you well, uh, let uh, me finish, Al. We'll let you you go right. to. And I understand your meaning of the word wrong means you disagree. Okay, and that's your opinion, Al. Okay, now. I'm going to give you the answers, so that way you won't have to fish well, around. Make it quick. But, well, okay. uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, I did not hear Joe's answer. So well, you'll get somebody else to call in. The value okay, we'll get another caller in. Uh, he asked a question, and, and we did not have a program to give him as a pulpit. Okay. Well, well. Okay, now let's get on to this program. Is What is the value? But we'll get to this later. Right now we're getting on to sacrifice. All right. And sacrifice means that people want more than one thing or they need more than one thing, and they cannot have both. That's the ordinary use of the word. That's it. All right. And then you have to give up one thing rather than another. It's interesting you say it that way because uh -huh. probably one of the earliest memories I could have of something that is thought of as sacrifice stems from my experience yes. in grade school sure. in Minnesota where on every Friday we had fish sticks. Uh -huh. And I didn't notice the correlation, but one of my classmates said uh -huh. that, well, we have fish sticks every Friday because some people here are Catholic, uh -huh. and some Catholics still don't want to eat meat on, on Friday. On Friday. Uh -huh. And yeah, so that's that because therefore they're sacrificing the luxury, I guess, of eating meat. Well, that was to the that Jesus was crucified on Friday, you uh -huh. see. And so, out of respect for that, you say they're going to give up meat. And, and giving up is the, has a connotation of sacrifice, sacrifice as well. Sacrifice, exactly. Now, but yet you were using it in a context of we can't have two things at once. Mm -hmm. So maybe, how, how could we 
save, how could we save your argument? So Go. Catholics were maybe giving up meat because they want the, the love of the Lord, and they couldn't have that if they were eating sure, during exactly, his. Sure, exactly. All righty. I, I, I think we might have another caller. Another, but, another caller. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, caller, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. So, so Al. No, that's we, another, we, we that's another you, caller. It's go, go ahead. All right. Now, listen. Now, let me say it again. You determine the value of anything uh -huh. and everything by what someone else is willing to pay for it. That means that Jesus Christ loves you so much, your eternal soul will go to hell. He paid the price because it's of great value to him. Okay, Al, here's a question. Who received this sacrifice? Who received the sacrifice? Yeah. Who was the Father. Okay, did he need it? He needed the payment for sin. Now, according to Acts, Somebody had to pay for your sins. According to you. So, the, in other words, on, on your view, this God needed that sacrifice. He needed a sacrifice that was a pure sacrifice mm -hmm. that was sinless. Okay, now, he needed it. That's, yes. your, that's your word. Now, well, Acts, no, that's your word. Well, okay, you tell me. Did he need it yes. or not? Did he need it or not? That... That is God's plan of salvation that was in the a, Bible. It's freely given to anybody who accepts it. You ducked the question. Let me ask it again. Did he need the sacrifice or not? Without the sacrifice, you would still die and go to hell. You have a hard time answering it, yes or no, right? No, I don't. I'd say, did he need it? Al, you haven't answered yes he or no. needed the sacrifice in okay. order for you to go to heaven. Okay. So okay, Al yeah. says he needed it. Now, according to Acts 17.25, God needs nothing. Look it up. Now, let's get on to our subject. Hey, uh, thanks for calling, Al. You haven't called in a while. I actually was a little worried about you. Yeah. Th <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks again. Now, the, um, uh, of course, where there's a need and a desire... Uh -huh. that, that helps create value. I mean, that's good common sense. All right. So we'll, we would agree on that. Now, the question is, who gets the payment and the sacrifice? Sometimes uh, some people do and some people don't. All right. Well, all right. So I, I better make you work uh, or earn your keep and say, well, why, why do we know that there was a payment involved? Now, these transactions with the deity sometimes do look like payment. Payments. Uh, but if, if I am... Um, uh, you know, obeying the speed limit or driving slowly and sensibly to be safe. I mean, there isn't there isn't quite the same recipient of a payment involved. There. Well, I I think you're right. The payment here means simply a cost. Uh huh. Okay. And what you cost what what it cost is you have to drive slower. Yeah. So it costs so some time and so costs on. Costs time. Yeah. Exactly. But but no one's receiving that time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and that's the difference. So the the way you phrased the question implied that someone's receiving the benefit that's, of the that's, sacrifice. That's what it is in the Old Testament too much, mm -hmm. is that there is a deity who needs this blood. And in that, fact, there's a passage in Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Okay. Now, this is a bloody religion. We've got to face the fact. Um, I guess I should ask it, that 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 uh, verse. In what context is it written? Without the shedding of blood, there is no. Remedy? Well, this is the the epistle to the Hebrews, okay. and it's a an attempt to reformulate the Hebrew tradition with doing away with animal sacrifice for one thing, mm -hmm. and have Jesus as a, a only sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And the final one. And the final one. All and right. that's, that's the genius of Paul. And All I right. think Paul was really caught, like Brother Al in some respect, just caught in the notion that you had to have blood sacrifice, you see. And so what I think Brother Paul did is realize, well, there have been plenty of Jews who have been killed 
mm-hmm. and under the Maccabean Revolution, for example, about 163 B.C., you had a lots of Jews who were killed. I, I believe we have another call. Um, all right. Okay. <laughs> and Sorry, those? I was distracted there. Okay, go ahead. Hello, caller. Can you give us a name or a nickname? B.J. Well, hello, B.J. Um, ple- uh, so we've got... Uh, uh, the subject here today about uh, sacrifice, and do you have a comment or a question that's on topic, please? Yeah, maybe um, God needed to sacrifice. Uh huh. Something great to change how some people, you know, he just wanted to get out there and needed the sacrifice to get garner the attention that he somehow doesn't get in his personal life. So he would just stir things up with people deliberately and deliberately go against what they believe. Well, BJ, that, that, that's your premise about what we're doing here on this show. You've called in with that premise several times. This will be the third. Yeah, okay. okay. I think the presupposition you're making, you correct me if you think I'm wrong, is, is the anthropomorphic premise. That, are you, do, are, am I wrong? Well, BJ, did you intend to call in for uh, an intelligent conversation? Well, no, not by calling this show. All right. Okay. Well, that's we good. understand, B.J. Well, that's all right. Now, let's get on with our topic. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Have time for comedians. <laughs> uh, now, the, the real problem with sacrifice in the, in the Hebrew Bible, it come, came partly out of war. All right. In fact, there's a passage that, that, that Yahweh is the God of war. Mm-hmm. And so you have this um, king of Moab who actually sacrifices his only son there in front of the enemy. Mm-hmm. And apparently that stops the battle. Now, we're not quite sure the interpretation of that. Some think it was so shocking to the enemy that it stopped the battle. Okay. Another interpretation was it's saying, okay, we realize that you're giving up. And we're not going to kill any more. You sacrificed your son. Okay. And that's a substitutionary sacrifice. All right. And uh, so the the Hebrew Bible and the, and the ancient Greek religion is filled with sacrifices. Much of it coming out of a war model. Yeah. And well, when you say Greek, I'm I'm aware of the sacrifice of Agamemnon's daughter for favorable mm-hmm. winds, so that they could mm-hmm. sail to Troy. I can't think of any other off the top of my head. Well, I'd have to uh, do a lot of more research to get exactly the dates <laughs> right. on it. But it's filled with mm-hmm. sacrifices because that was just part of the culture. Now, in the in the Iliad, you know, I've read the Iliad, uh-huh. um, and they talk always about you know um, uh, basically um, you know. Uh, you know, killing cattle and and uh, 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 you know throwing some of the fatty parts to make a sweet savor to Jupiter or Zeus, uh-huh. um, but much of this really to me is describing a communal meal. I think you got a good point. Yeah. In fact, um, it it basically is killing two birds with one stone. All right. Uh, after all, community and God, the, the theory of a God and community go together. All right. And what really is being sacrificed, or who is being appeased sometimes, is another community or somebody within the community. We have, for example, capital punishment is a kind of a sacrifice to appease the community. Yeah, okay. That is... That is a projection of it that's very plausible. It's a blood sacrifice, you see. To appease the wrath of the community. So some arguments for capital punishment is that, well, it, it prevents someone who is maybe not curable. Mm-hmm. The other is that they have to pay for a life with a life. In other mm-hmm. words, yes. there, exactly. there's a debt. Life um, for life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Blood for blood. All right, yeah. It's a very Old Testament then. Yeah, and in fact, it goes back to very other ancient cultures. It's not just the, the ancient Hebrew culture. A lot of cultures have held It's It's a tribalistic all right. Well, so let me try and you know undermine your your sure. argument there and say, well, in the Bible, the first murder would be Abel by Cain, mm-hmm. and right there, the deity did not ask for death for death. In fact, he, you know, Cain says, "Oh, where shall I go? You know, I'll be, 
you know, mm-hmm. hunted or hounded, and and am I, if I'm remembering correctly, the deity put a mark on him, basically saying, you know, don't touch. Okay, what you have in the Hebrew Bible is a lot of various viewpoints because it's written by human beings and, and they're struggling to try to try to balance their different values. And, and maybe Genesis was actually written later, and that's why it has evolved. Yeah, G- Genesis is written probably after the exile, which is about 5 of the southern kingdom, which is about 586. Mm-hmm. And so said. the writer of it was probably trying to look for a way to, well, the, to mitigate uh, the eye for an eye kind of thing. Oh, yes. In other words, what, what it amounts to is when they get, went into Babylonian captivity, um, they began to come into contact with another culture. And that makes you think about your own culture. Because you can see the absurdity of some things in another culture better, you can see them in your own culture. All right. But when you see how absurd it might be in another culture, you might think, well, some aspects of our own might be equally absurd. Uh, you get and, to uh-huh. learn by comparing and contrasting. Comparing and contrasting, yeah. And yeah. I think the Apostle Paul is a good example of this. Apparently, he's. He's coming from a Jewish tradition, but also mm-hmm. from a G- Gentile environment, and now he's he knows that circumcision is a major part of the Hebrew tradition, but he All wants right. to give it up because uh-huh. he's trying to deal with the Gentiles. So. And and converts are more important to him than tradition. Than that tradition, exactly. All right. He figures the Hebrew tradition of a God is more important than dietary laws and circumcision laws, and so... He's prepared to say those are incidental compared to this other. Now, we're talking about the, trying to stay back on the subject on sacrifice. All right. The, um, we're, we're not trying to make some mystical thing out of this. We, we know what this is about. People sacrifice all the time some aspects of their life or sometimes some, somebody else's life as in terms of war in order to get what they want. And I think you can find in parts of the Hebrew Bible uh, many, many ca- cases in which uh, in battle the slaves or others who happen to be murdered in another tribe in a war or the warriors are treated as a sacrifice to God. Mm-hmm. And the word in English is translated B-A-N, translated ban, but it's a, it's a devoted to God. Mm-hmm. And that included child sacrifice for a long time. Now, mm-hmm. it seems to me, you know, so I come from, of course, the English usage of the word sacrifice, which usually means something we give up. Uh-huh. Whereas if we're forcing someone else to give something up, that's, that's more along the lines of, of, let's say, it is an offering. It's an appeasement or an offering. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. In other words, you've got to pay for what, the offense. Made. Yeah, well, the, this, this sort of offering was that, well, I'm offering you this cow because I wasn't going to offer myself. In other words, exactly. In other words, it's, it's substitutionary atonement. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, in fact, you have many cases in the Hebrew Bible references to child sacrifice, mm-hmm. and uh, the story of Isaac is just one. And uh, the, the reason you have a prohibition against it is because it was being practiced. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a point about it. There would have been no reason to talk yeah. about it. In other words, the story of Ab- uh, yeah, Abraham's Isaac. And Isaac, yeah. as, uh, offer to sacrifice Isaac is evidence of some cultural practices exactly, at that time. Yeah, yeah. In, col- in Genesis 22, you have these early Hebrews struggling with the question, if God won't sacrifice of children... Then you have also have be fruitful and multiply. That seems to be contradictory. And so they are giving up the notion of child sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And that's what the story, and there's a quarter of the Jeff story of which it kind of so, contradicts that. Yeah, we have another caller. Okay. All right, we've oh, got good. another caller. Yeah, go ahead. We have a caller. Go ahead. Hello, Charles. Hello, Charles. Okay, Charles. Yeah, um, the concept of sacrifice, uh-huh. um, 
Well, what what language are you talking about? We just yeah, that's, that's the point. I was, what I was making meanings of word can change over time. Exactly. And, and what a word means in English, and it's supposed to be equivalent in, say, ancient Latin or ancient Greek or ancient Hebrew or ancient uh, uh, Egyptian. Okay, go ahead. Okay, if you want to, if you wanted to find the history of the word sacrifice in English, you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, which is about five to six volumes, and it will give the dates and a small quote to trace the, just for the English alone, over the centuries, how the word is used. Mm-hmm. And what I'm trying to say is basic. And all of these definitions is giving up something. And Joe, you think that would be in the Hebrew word as well? It's in the Hebrew word too, yeah. Uh That's basically what it means. Now, in... Something dear to you, usually. Yeah, I was going to say, and in English, um, you know, I tend to think of that word sacrifice means that, you know, I'm giving up one thing because I'm hoping to get a better benefit. Exactly. Um, Sometimes it might be that I want to benefit others. Mm -hmm. Um... But and so I'm, I'm willing to travel slowly because why well, I'm safer, but I'm also being safer for others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do you think that the Hebrew word would have had the similar same connotations? Meaning, same meaning. Here you have a God in control of the weather and lightning and storm. All right. And according to the priest, and the priest uh, needing food. That, that's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the but, priests were hungry. But the uh, and and you have the priest interpreting this. As being this lightning and stun storm, the priests interpreting this to be the wrath of the deity, and the deity, since he's angry and wrathful, needs a sacrifice. And yeah, but uh, the interesting part of the mm-hmm. uh, many of the ancient cultures is they would sacrifice the part of the bull or the mm-hmm. lamb or the sheep or something that really wasn't all that edible. Well, that makes good. Go. That's that's called bargaining, practicality. Uh, they bargained with the deity, of course. Yeah, yeah. So what after all that wonderful part that were good to eat? Uh, why they were a communal was there meal? A communal feast. Yes. Or was there a, well, that's his point. Right. That's uh, that, that was Lee's point. Is that this had in combination with the communal feasts, and so. The priest got the first dish <laughs> and then yeah. passed around. In other words, you don't sacrifice totally the food <laughs> because the deity literally doesn't eat it, and that's why they refer to the deity smelling the smoke. The sweet savor. Yeah. Sweet savor. Now, the, the ancient Greeks would often um, mm-hmm. perform a little sacrifice where before they began their meal, they would sacrifice to their <laughs> patron god by pouring a little wine on the ground, you know, just a little sip for mm-hmm. the gods. And, of course, the gods apparently drink it right up because it's gone once it hits the soil. Some of the rabbis developed the notion that prayer is a substitute. All right. And I like Paul the Apostle in the 12th chapter, first chapter, uh, 12th chapter of Romans, the first verse, let your bodies be a living sacrifice. You see, now this is a, see what I'm suggesting is people, they inherit a religion and then they modify it in light of other values that they inherit and they try to put them together. And this is what the early Hebrews did with child sacrifice, be fruitful. Yes, I uh, remember uh, at um, mm-hmm. one of the websites I go to that it uh, points out that in uh, mm-hmm. one part of, I think it's Genesis, mm-hmm. it says you shall sacrifice the firstborn mm-hmm. of all living things, including your children. And then a couple of chapters later in Genesis, it says you don't need to uh, sacrifice your firstborn children. Apparently that was so hap- that, that shows a change in the concept of exactly. what is and isn't a necessary sacrifice. Exactly, yeah. 
the Egyptians apparently were doing a lot of sacrificing of the firstborn. Now, maybe that was among animals primarily. I, I, I suspect so. Um, you know, I, 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 I've read a, a, enough about ancient uh -huh. Egyptian culture to know that at the time where pharaonic history begins, mm -hmm. which is almost simultaneously with writing and the first pharaoh, Menem, they were condemning child sacrifice. And that's mm -hmm. probably because there was a tradition of it that was, if not within living memory, at least recent memory. Mm -hmm. um, and they had grown wealthy by then, and so there was no, re no reason no to do choice, it. Uh, and so much like what you, you say, Joe, is that their, their traditions were now modified to condemn that which was no longer necessary. As a matter of fact, that story of, uh, of uh, Moses coming out of Egypt yeah. and Zipporah, his wife, All right. when, when, tells him, in effect, you have the notion, apparently, of the deity warning the death of the son. All right. And Moses' the, son. And, uh -huh. it, uh, the text is not altogether clear, but that's the way most Hebrew scholars interpret it. I think I remembered it as that the deity had decided to kill Moses, but well, that's what I'm on. saying. It's it's unclear. All right. But the main thing is that Zipporah comes up with the notion: give God the foreskin, a portion of the human body. Yeah, uh -huh. foreskin, and that's as about as good a deal as you can come up with. <laughs> All right. I mean, that's pretty smart. <laughs> and furthermore, it's very ancient. Because it says she did the job with a flint stone. That's before the Iron Age. Yep. So I'm suggesting... I, I'm beginning to think that that flint stone may have been a, a, a remembrance of human sacrifice uh, in a ritual manner with a ritual tool. Yeah. A specific... That you had to make a very specific type of tool to do the sacrifice with. And in this case, the... It would have been a uh, flint knife instead of a bronze or iron. I think you got a really good point. Yep. Here you have a good example of substitutionary atonement. Instead of substituting an animal, right now you're just substituting foreskin. Yeah. All right. And that's uh, a pretty smart woman <laughs> under those conditions. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one of the things about uh, sacrifice... Uh huh. Is that until, you know, hold on, let this train go by, blast it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I want to touch on something that Brother Al mentioned it later on. Okay, let's go. I don't want to hear the train. Okay, you call back later because we've got a program. All right. Okay, we'll deal with that later. Now, Brother Al was calling in about the sacrifice of Jesus. All right. Okay. I think. Here's one possible interpretation. See what you think out there. Is Paul the Apostle, working in a Hebrew world and a Greek world, could see all this sacrifice? And, and also you had Plato was over there among the Greeks before Paul. All right. Saw that this might not be very, very respectful of the, of the deity to be committing all this murder and slaughter in his name. All right. And I suggest that maybe Paul came up with a notion that we treat, see, here's a Jew thing. Let's treat one of these Jews, Joshua, mm -hmm. as the final sacrifice, and that ends it all right. once and for all. In other words, he couldn't change the whole culture. But he could take something within the culture. Now, the Maccabeans had already said in 163 B.C., 163 years or so years before Paul, okay. that those lives counted as a kind of offering to God. Mm -hmm. You see, so it seemed to me Paul was not getting divine revelations, although he may have thought he was. He's thinking through this problem, mm -hmm. taking this value and that value and other values that he inherited, putting them together and trying to come up with a more coherent solution. And so he says, well, let's let one of these 
major sacrifices count and and, and it obliterates <laughs> and the balance sheet finally is, is, closed. is, is closed and that's exactly what it is and the epistle to the hebrews is pretty much saying that jesus is the final it says clearly the final sacrifice he's the priest he's also the temple all right that's the end of it we don't even have to build the temple again. no exactly well joe we've come past the halfway point here and I'm hoping that we can get the video uh, to run for ASK and RET. Is the technology with us? Make it so. Beliefs, or simply believe in one less God than everyone else? Well, you're not alone. The Atheist Society of Knoxville is a fun and friendly group of people just like you that meets twice a week at a bar or restaurant. We meet every Tuesday night following the show at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria for happy hour. You'll find our group either inside or on the patio. Look for Richard Dawkins' silver-jacketed book, The God Delusion, standing upright on the table. On Fridays, we meet at Agave Azul or the Beard and Beer Market. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke or punch, please don't. We all question what we believe at one point in our lives. If this is the time for you, come join us for food, drink, conversation, and fun. Do you find stories of talking snakes laughable? Do you prefer the scientific method over supernatural beliefs? Are you concerned about religious leaders and organizations imposing their values and rules on your body, your family, and the rest of our society? Well, take comfort in the fact that you're not alone. The Rationalists of East Tennessee meets weekly for fellowship and provides a forum for people who support skeptical thinking and rational discussion of these and other issues. To find out more information or to find out about our next meeting, visit us on the web at www.rationalist.org. If you live in, we're back. Um, I want to tell you about this month, uh, the Skeptics Book Club, mm -hmm. on June fourteenth uh, at two p.m. at Books a Million on Kingston Pike. The book will be Stuff Matters: Exploring the Marvelous Materials That Shape Our Man-Made World mm -hmm. by Mark. Oh, I'm going to mangle his name, Midonawick. Please join us um, at Books a Million. 8513 Kingston Pike. Um, he, he poses such questions as, why is glass see-through? What makes elastic <laughs> stretchy? Huh? Why does any material look and behave the way it does? These are the sorts of questions that renowned material scientist Mark Minodownik <laughs> constantly asks himself. He studies objects as ordinary as an envelope and as unexpected as concrete cloth. Mm -hmm. uncovering, uncovering fascinating secrets that hold together our physical world. In Stuff Matters, he explores the materials he encounters in a typical morning, mm -hmm. from the steel of his razor to the foam in his sneakers. Uh -huh. um, I have read this book, and it was marvelously fun. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the premise of it is there's a photograph of him having breakfast, and then chapter by chapter he talks about the materials that are there with him as he has breakfast, on the roof of his London flat. All right. Uh, also coming up is the Smoky Mountain Free Thought Advance. That's not a retreat. Yeah. Uh, a retreat is where some people go into the mountains, but we're going to uh, go into the mountains as an advance. Uh -huh. And we will talk about the good news. The Rationalists of East Tennessee is holding a free thought event in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains in Townsend, Tennessee. This is July 3rd and 4th. The cost is 120 per person. Children under 18 are free. Meals are a la carte. And there is, uh, or at an additional fee. Um, uh, this happens at the Tremont Lodge and Resort. And um, yeah, tickets are required. And you'll want to contact us via our website, which is rationalists.org. Let's see, activities will include uh, a list of speakers, um, Free Thought Jeopardy, and of course it's the 4th of July weekend, there will be fireworks in the uh -huh, area. Uh -huh. All right, so visit the rationalist.org website mm -hmm. and you'll find right there at the top uh, further instructions for interested parties. Um, you, know, we, um, you know, we know that there'll be people coming from you know, North Carolina, uh, Georgia, so it'll be a regional event to meet other free thinkers. That's great. Right, All right. right here in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
Okay, so we're back on to sacrifice, and you you had something marked out in this book. Now, this is a very good book, Dying for the Gods. Dying for the Gods. Yeah. Well, all right. I, I and can't. the other book we're referring to is War in the Hebrew Bible by Susan, Susan Nadich. All right. Just, and who is Dying by the Gods for? And this is um, Miranda Green. All right. Now, here is a passage from Jeremiah, he quotes. All right. Read this, it to This me. is a prophet. And they have built the high places of Baal, that's to a god named Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause the sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Moloch, which is a god, and pass through the fire is fiery sacrifice. Okay, and it means death. It's not just evil Knievel on a motorcycle going through this no, little ring. Exactly. It's, it's a horrible thing. It's, it's death. Okay. And, and this is a, a sacrifice to the gods because they want some favor from the god or else relief from the punishment the god is giving them. All right. Which, according to Jeremiah, he's presumably quoting the deity now, his deity, All Yahweh. Right. I did not command. All See, right. Neither did it come to my mind. He didn't no. even think of it. Yeah, well, it's something he didn't. Now, if he was omnipotent and <laughs> omniscient, he'd have to think about it. But you get the point. Yeah. This is not something he really considered as a possibility. Yeah. That they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. In other words, here's a clear refutation of some aspect of the sacrificial system as right. being simply evil because it conflicts other important values in the community. In other words, at the time Jeremiah wrote this, Jeremiah's idea of the deity wouldn't have even considered child sacrifice. A, a, no. It no, wasn't on the table. But it was being practiced in his time. It, yes. and, and condemned by the deity. Yeah. It's, it's almost yeah, as if this deity, deity doesn't remember that he asked Isaac for a child sacrifice at one time. Yeah, well, he gave him instead a, a ram. I, yeah, how fortunate that was. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, if, yeah if, I, if I had Jeremiah here, I would say, well, wait a minute. Didn't the deity once ask for a child sacrifice? Did he change his mind? Or it's just sacrifice if it goes to Baal is bad. Well, the old theory that developed out of that is that, well, it was just a test. The, the Isaac uh, Yeah, now if it's test. a test, it's who doesn't know the answer? Well, Yahweh presumably already knew the answer, otherwise he wouldn't have been Yahweh. Uh -huh. So presumably it's supposed to be the reader. And I think that's who supposed to be the beneficiary of this story is the readers. To say All right. Yahweh no longer and never did want sacrifice from by children in the first place. Well, that does sort of save the so the story, so to speak. Yes, it does. Um, and some of the rabbis in those days afterwards began to praise Isaac for being willing to be a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But that should have been revised. I was going to say, that's interesting because that presages uh, you know, Jesus maybe being a, quote, willing sacrifice. What's interesting is some of the writers in the Christian tradition just don't like to refer to that as the same kind of thing. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's so bothersome because that sort of implies that the Lord God of the universe still wants human sacrifice. Okay. And that's what a crucifixion of Jesus is mm -hmm. under that particular version of theology. Yeah. Now, to be fair to some Christians, so you have various Christians with various different interpretations of this. All right. Let me give you an example in from the Middle Ages. Um, actually, before we do it, let me, let me mm -hmm. interject because I thought you were going somewhere else with that, and that oh, is yeah. that I thought you were going to say some Christians don't like that Isaac was prepared to be a willing sacrifice because it made Jesus maybe less special. I thought that's what was going to come out of your mouth, and it didn't. No, what it, what it was, it bothers them that it, it, it reminds them that, after all, the sacrifice of Jesus is the sacrifice of a human being. Yeah, is right. that what God wanted? Apparently in Genesis, no. Now suddenly in the New, afterwards... In the New Testament, presumably, yeah, it's, it the does. answer is yes again. And, and and I think Paul hadn't. Paul saw through all of this, in my opinion. 
I think he was like an anthropologist at that point. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, okay, I'm going to accept the presupposition, and now we're going to simply abolish it. In other words, he said, even uh, worst case scenario, the deity did want it, but now no more. We're, we're done. Yeah. 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 All right. Now, because it, it was it was not actually homicide; it was deicide that made deicide, it extra yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul, I don't think had that <laughs> vocabulary. Well, he, he was stuck with the presupposition, and he did the best he could under the presuppositions mm -hmm. and the culture. Now, in the the Middle Ages. And this is about, you know, 1,100 years later. You had Anselm saying, this is Anselm, a priest, saying that God's honor had been offended and therefore he had to have the sacrifice to appease it. But he's so good, he's decided just to kill his own son and that will satisfy his honor. Well, that doesn't... Abelard, however, I was going to say the word "good" just doesn't come with that. It doesn't come across. No. Yeah. Abelard had another view that Christ came, and from this, so you could see them trying to rework their values mm -hmm. in light of other values. Their Abelard was saying that Jesus came not as a sacrifice to God, but to teach people what is good and decent and kind, and in the process, he got executed. Mm -hmm. And that's a sacrifice he made to do good. And that's a different interpretation. It's a cost that he paid to do some good, but it didn't, this is not blood sacrifice to the deity. And it that's, was, a, that's a it major... Was that he was going to run afoul of the earthly authorities. Exactly, exactly. And that's, much of that's already in the New Testament. And I think that's ingenious. Of, of, uh, in other words, Christ did not die for the sins of people. He died from Abelard's point of view because <laughs> of the evil that people were committing at that time. Mm -hmm. He came to do some good. Well, that's, that seems very at odds, though, with you know, most of the New Testament that I've read. The, where it's What part of the New Testament is at odds with? Well, um... The, the the epistle to the Hebrews, it is. I think you're right. But well, I, I'm thinking, I, I've read the Gospels more. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 after the Gospels, I read that portion only through once. So there may be elements I'm blind to. I missed on the first pass, on the one and only time I read mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, within the, the Gospels, you see time and again uh, Jesus talking about how, you know, he's... He's kind of come to. He's he's come with a mission, and that mm -hmm. mission has the sinister overtone mm -hmm. of he's come to die. Okay, now did he come to die as a consequence of being involved with human beings and gets executed because he preaches goodness, or did he come in order to be a blood sacrifice to appease the angry, wrathful deity? Uh, I think within the Gospels you'll find both. Both. Yeah, I think you might be right. I think the epistle to the Hebrews has it, but he's also trying to work around it. All right. Well, you had some more something marked in this book that you wanted us to read? Yeah, if you got time to um, do that. Huh? All right, so is it this uh, thing here in, marked in this, the margin? The bond as sacrifice is an ideology of war in which the enemy is to be utterly destroyed as an offering to the deity who mm -hmm. has made victory possible. Mm -hmm. Implicit in this theology is a view of God who mm -hmm. appreciates human sacrifice and a curious respect for human life. Yeah, notice, it's a curious respect for human life. In other words, human beings are so respectful so that if you sacrifice a human being, that's a real sacrifice to God. Hmm. And that's then they had to work through that. In other words, they had two values there, and there's a third value that just conflicts with it. All right. So it, it goes on here. Human beings are the most desirable and valuable of offerings, mm -hmm. and are mm -hmm. uh, and are the portion of God. Uh, that's a funny sentence to me. The portion of God. What would the author have meant by the portion of God? Well, in other words, it fits with what you were just saying. That, that God gets some of the sacrifice and then the community gets the rest. Oh, that's what portion means in that context. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. 
<laughs> it was, it's obvious once you explained it. Well, here in the margin, you've written something. Um, and you've written, present your body as the living sacrifice. I believe you're quoting... Paul the Apostle the, and once the Romans, again, yeah. The yeah. epistles. And that's a major change. Paul partly borrowed this, partly from the ancient Hebrews, translating sacrifice, uh, uh, moving away from that toward prayer. In other words, God prefers prayer rather than blood sacrifice. And then Paul is moving one step saying good deeds serve better than just praying. Mm -hmm. And he's not a, obliterating prayer. He's just saying, in other words, you've got values here in conflict. Now, it's funny when you say prayer and deeds, because as I recall in mm -hmm. the Bible I read, there was the phrase, um, something to do that we're saved by faith alone versus elsewhere, faith and works. Well, you got, well, Paul's now, view yeah, is... Or, am I confl or is it really a different passage you're talking about? Well, we're different altogether. Paul's okay. view, and you, and I, I'm glad you brought this up, Paul's view, that's why he's an interesting character to me, is he is basically saying, if you want this fire insurance, <laughs> this salvation, uh, then it is not through works. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of grace. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's saying you can't simply do bookkeeping mm -hmm. and get to the pearly gates, as it were. Mm -hmm. You get there because the deity wants you there, and it's a good gift. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, <laughs> you seem to say that with so much enthusiasm for it, Joe, because I believe that that is the single most evil sentence in the New Testament. Go ahead. That we are saved by faith alone and not works. Okay, because that. That excuses people of faith okay. from doing good, okay. and therefore it can enable great evil, and therefore within the New Testament, it is the most evil sentence. Okay, I got you. So, and I, and I can, can understand. Can you try and defend it, uh, attack well, my view? Well, I'm not going to tell you because you're making good sense. <laughs> you don't want to limit, eliminate good work. All right. What I'm trying to show is Paul is really bringing good works back to where it belongs. That's in the community and helping people and doing good deeds. Mm -hmm. And then if you want fire insurance, that's a matter of God's grace anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, you don't do brownie points to get into heaven, I think is what Paul is saying. Mm -hmm. Because there are not enough brownie points you can do. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, and I could easily be, because when I read uh, the, the, oh, yeah. the Bible, I was not aware of the idea about you know, the Asuda epigraphy, meaning the, you know, Pseudo, books, yeah. books that are written and attributed to Paul that may not be. Mm -hmm. But that, that, you know, we're saved by grace alone, maybe genuine Pauline. That's Galatians and Romans, yeah. Okay, and then uh -huh. we're saved by, you know, faith and works is attributed to Paul, but is probably a different well, author who got, was trying you, to... You got, you got faith and works in, in the, the epistle of James. Okay. And the and some think James is written to counter Paul's view. Okay. Well, I'm already in favor of James then. Well, okay. They're talking about two different things, I think. All right. And I, I'm with Paul on this. If you're going to end that model, now, I don't buy the model, but I think I buy the psychology. Mm -hmm. Paul's psychology makes sense. In other words, nobody can ever earn a state of perfection. That's a lunacy. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I have to come down on that and say uh, we have to expect people to do things here in the real world for good, and that to say that that um, that works don't matter exempts people from doing good. It doesn't matter in terms of brownie points to get to the next life. And if that's how the deity works, the deity is is an instrument of evil as well. Then. Okay, Paul then had to face this problem. Mm -hmm. And he then f comes up with the view, if you have accepted this gift of grace, then your motivation is going to be much better for doing good works. In other words, your your good works are going to be to help people not to earn brownie points 
Because your body point approach is simply self-service. Hey, have, have you read um, Purpose Driven Life by uh, Rick Warren? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, he's he's just all over that thing about, you know, we're created for the pleasure of God, and he's he he has he's not saying anything about the value of works. Well, okay. And I'm, I think Rick Warren is, is, has focused on the worst part of the New Testament. Well, I agree with you. That's, that's a matter of taking one part and forgetting the other part. Yep. That's a good example. Yeah. And I guess that's why I say that that sentence can enable great evil because... Yeah, it can, of yeah. course, yeah. All right. Well, it's, it's called, as a word for it, it's called antinomianism. Antinomianism. What is? What are the the roots of that word? Anti, I understand. What's this nomianism? It's just a, it's the Greek word nomos, meaning law. Oh, all right. So anti-law. Yeah. In other words, if you, in other words, antinomianism says, well, if we're under grace, we don't have any law, we don't have any rules, we can just live the way we want. Hmm. And that's Man, I didn't. I didn't never thought to use the words that way. Okay. That isn't what Paul really was trying to say. All right, because that, of course, is the accusation thrown against non-believers that, oh, well, without the threat of damnation, what motivation will you have to do good? Well, I asked a preacher once, I said, suppose yeah. you don't believe in the hell. You, personally, you're going out and commit rape and murder. Is that the kind of guy you are, personally? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know, I, I wanted to really be specific about that. Yeah. Yeah, you're the kind of guy, if you thought you weren't going to, uh, there, there were no heaven you you you're a rapist at heart. Is that who you are? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he probably I, I said get a, no. I didn't get a straight answer on yeah, that. <laughs> well, all right. But yeah. I thought I thought it was a fair question. Then. All right. Well, man, we're we're less than two minutes now. I was, well, well, I was well, wishing we, we might get at least one more caller, but I think we're. Well, we're let, trying, let me let me develop if you got time. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. Let's recap. Now, when Paul when Paul is trying to rework his religion. Uh, or his morals. Uh, he's trying to say, um, after all, in the fifth chapter of Galatians, he makes clear that murder and thievery, those things are still taboo. Mm -hmm. See, he's not opposing all laws. He's saying, don't go treating all of these as somehow an ego trip to build yourself up into the good favor of the deity. Mm -hmm. You do good things because you've already had a lot of grace in the world, and you're grateful. Mm -hmm. In other okay. words, a lot of motivation out of life is you are involved with people with gratitude and the pleasure you get in working with other people, not just because you've got a law saying don't steal. And I think that's a better psychology. I, it's an argument to be a good citizen. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that means be involved and related to and caring for other people because that's what a conversion really is. We convert a rather selfish two-year-old <laughs> slowly into a more civil human being. And, in fact, the word civil does seem to represent a good way to talk about it because two-year-olds can sometimes be... Cute and vicious all at once. Yeah, and uh, and part of part of coming of age is gently nurturing them into a good life. All right, well, Joe, I see by the clock that we've got less than a minute left. Let's start telling our viewers uh, that this has been Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. You can see us most days, most Tuesdays, from five to six p.m. Um, and tell your friends out of uh, state that they can see us on ctvknox.org. Um, we want to thank our callers. Thank our callers. We had uh, Al and, and Charles. Charles were uh, good to have some back and forth with. And we had one other caller. I've forgotten who it was. Uh, that was BJ, and um, um, we didn't have much uh, to go back and forth with there. Um, but I want to appreciate the callers and, uh, and, and appreciate our audience. And we will see you, or some hosts will see you next week at this time.